A very hearty good morning to our honorable guests, dignitaries, on and off dice, and all my aspiring student managers. I, Anjali Singh, welcomes you all to BITM 12th Business Conclave 2017, Day 2. Amongst us is a very successful CEO and a whole time director of Movmi Wireless Solutions Limited, Bengaluru, Mr. Satya Kalyan Sundaram, a seasoned professional with over 18 years of progressively expanding experience. Satya Sir blends a unique combination of strategy, finance, as well as operations acumen. He is focused on providing solutions through verticals such as mobile commerce, analytics, and fintech. Satya Sir earned the MBA in finance from University of Hartford in United States. He is a certified public accountant and certified information system auditor, having received both these certifications while working in United States. Satya Sir is most recently the Director of Finance and Administration at Scientific Games, a $3 billion US dollar diversified worldwide gaming company. Sir has worked in US for eight years and relocated to India in 2005. He has also worked in companies like Texas Instruments, Moship Semiconductor, Alliance Consulting, Fusion Technologies, and Wipo, Lubi Association, and Reuters. Satya Sir was inducted into the CFO Institute League of Excellence in 2015. He is a multi year awardee of the Institute Top 100 CFO as well. Well, the list of Sir's talent is. Well, the list of Sir's talent is endless. Therefore, now I request Sir to enlighten students and share your world of knowledge with us. Sir, the dice is all yours. Yeah, it's an absolute honor to be here, to be in front of all of you. I get a lot of adrenaline talking to students. Um, I've generally felt that I've learned more talking to you than talking to anybody else. And I walk away with a lot more learning. So this is uh, equally selfish for me to try and pick up stuff from all of you. So you're from four different schools. And the topic for the week or the weekend is uh, futuristic trends and challenges to business schools. So I have, I generally break away from the mold of what is given to me to speak. Uh, people who have invited me to speak generally realize that after they've done that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to deviate from the topic, but I'm going to talk about futuristic trends in general and not just business schools. Uh, on how they need to react, but as people, as students, as citizens, in general, how we need to prepare for everything. So like I said, it's going to be fairly, a, li a little interactive. I'm going to ask questions once in a while, um, and feel free to interrupt and ask questions as well, and then we'll take it from there. So. I think they went through this already, so I'm going to skip this. So what is mob me? I uh, want to spend maybe five, ten minutes on what our company is. So a lot of people ask, why did you create a name called mob me? So we didn't think of it that way. We actually, it's an acronym for mobile media entertainment. So we wanted to be in these three spaces. And interestingly, this is the name that we were able to come up with. So that's, that's how we came up with the name. The company itself is 10 years old, a little over 10 years old. Uh, we have interest in telecom. We have interest in fintech. And we have interest in analytics. And we try to grow all of them. Currently, we are trying to focus on two of the three. How many of you have uh, heard of this company called Chiller? Okay, I'm, I'm actually disappointed. I thought that at least in the student community, it'd be a lot more. How many of you use Chiller? Oh, you use Chiller, okay, okay. So Chiller is our group company. It's a peer-to-peer -peer payments application. Um, so two things I want to spend time here. We actually believe that we dream different. And one of the reasons why we take a lot of time to hire people is their ability to think and dream different. Uh, so that's a core thing that we get involved. 
I get involved in interviews at pretty much all levels, no matter what they t what level they are. And we always focus on innovation. We are always coming up with something new. If you look at the prior foil, we've spent about we've brought out about seven companies already. So we are always going to be doing this. We are always going to be churning new ideas. That's a key thing. And the thing that I spend a lot of time on to talk about is we always ensure that we have a lot of fun in the office. Right? So this is something I talk a little bit. What you work has to come from what you dream. Your dreams and visions will decide what you want to do. So ideally, you should join an organization where your dream of doing something is aligned with what they are dreaming. And then their businesses will just drive structure. From there, it will drive execution. And from there, it will drive profitability. So those things just fall. But if you are lucky enough and have the opportunity to work for a company that thinks and acts along the same line as you, then you should immediately join them. And we have four different kinds of uh, companies that we do. We either have homegrown ones, we acquire, we invest, and we have innovation. So Chiller and Gecko List, our analytics solution are all innovations that we do. These didn't exist two years ago. So whenever you board a plane nowadays, you immediately get a message saying, how was your experience? When you buy anything, whether it's on the internet or anywhere else, you ask, you immediately get a question asking, how was your experience in doing this purchase? So the concept of customer experience itself is to take feedback from customers on a regular basis to try and improve the offering. The analytics behind that is called customer experience analytics. It's as simple as that, right? There's, the key thing is that India is going to become the largest market for customer experience. Everything that we do, everything that we work on has some form of a customer. We are all customers to somebody, be it a bank, be it an online shop, be it travel, anything. So our opportunity is to try and analyze the feedback to help the enterprise to provide better customer service. That's what Gecko List does. And then our second large interest is in fintech. We've done work with about 15 different banks and we build anything to do with their mobility applications. Uh, we are empaneled by one of the five companies in India that are empaneled by the State Bank of India to do their mobility. And anything related to, related to mobility in the BFSI sector is something that we are involved in. So these are our two important streams. Okay, so I'm going to get into the meat of the presentation. The new paradigm in today's world is limited only by your imagination. If you can imagine it, you can do it, whatever it is. I did not believe it for a long time. I believe it fully right now. And it's not because I'm smart enough to figure it out. It's experiences that teach you that. So as you start your corporate lives and as you start doing things, please understand that the only limitation for you is your own imagination of what you can do. Look at this. Um, I don't know how clear this is, but in maybe another five years, there will be no people building cars. As it is, about 80% of that is done by machines. In about five years, all 100% will be done by machines. So we are actually talking about a large-scale shift of what people can do and a large-scale shift of what machines can do, and robots and AIs and all of that. We are transforming into something called a knowledge economy. In a knowledge economy, and this is the world I'm talking about, in a knowledge economy, people and ideas will be valued more than anything else. 
How many of you have used Airbnb? Used, not no, used. Okay. How much of real estate do they own? Zero. They have about a thousand people in total. And they have more real estate covered in the world than anybody else. How many of you have heard of this company called WeWork? Okay, what does WeWork do? Exactly. They provide office space for people who want office space. So they lease office space to you. And they actually don't own any of it. They have just been valued at $40 billion. So it's not the assets that you own. It's not the capital that you have. It's not the labor force. I'm 50,000 people strong. What's your company headcount? Instagram had 10 employees when it was sold to Facebook for a billion. So creative ideas and creative people will always be valued more. And that's the trend that you will see more and more. It's not about how many people you have. It's about how smart you are and how you're going to use that. That's the most important thing. This is exactly how Singapore looked in the 60s. It was a very large fishing village. Okay. Which country did Singapore want to model itself on when they started this transformation? There are many countries. Take a guess. You're saying some names. You can be loud. That's fine. There's no wrong answer. Japan, then? I'll take two more. There's some other names coming up here. Yeah. India. <laughs> okay. Okay, somebody's trying to be funny, okay. England, okay. Singapore wanted to model itself around Sri Lanka. You know why? Sri Lanka is an island. It has tourism, it has ports, and it has industry. And in the 60s, Sri Lanka was the model economy for a lot of island countries of small size because they had stability, they had peace, all of that. Where is Sri Lanka today and where is Singapore today? Why did this happen? It's simple. There are some things that a knowledge economy creates that will always push it forward as a civilization better than anybody else. And that's what Singapore did, which Sri Lanka didn't keep up. There's economic incentive. What I mean by economic incentive is that when you graduate, you actually have a job that pays enough to maintain your lifestyle. There's an economic incentive to do something. There's an economic incentive to perform in the arts. There's an economic incentive to play a sport. The population is educated and creative. India's education rates are starting to climb. But the most advanced civilizations have high levels of education. And they're creative. They come up with new ideas. The economy allows that. The civilization allows that. There's an information infrastructure. What I mean by that is that ideas are free-flowing. People share information. Today, this is there for almost any country in the world. But are you aware that India is still way behind in terms of information availability? India is still way behind in terms of infrastructure. I'm talking internet infrastructure. I think we are like possibly fifth from the last in terms of internet speeds or something like that. So we still have a lot of way to catch up. 
So information infrastructure is very dynamic. It continues to improve. And the last one, effective innovation. The allows, the civilization allows for effective innovation. So when you have these four in a civilization, the rate of growth and the rate of movement is always much higher than anybody else. One of the things I'm going to do today is to try and confuse you a bit because a lot of people are providing information and their version of what they believe is going to happen. What I want to do is to try and confuse you and to kind of bend your mind a little bit so that you go back thinking about stuff as opposed to saying, okay, here's what Satya said, it must be true. No, I don't want you to think that way. I want you to say, okay, why is, why is this happening? What are these questions? People who think more and people who question more usually end up becoming the most successful people on earth. So my aim is to try and get you a little bit more confused than you were this morning. So that's why I've on purpose not put a flow to the deck because I want to bring certain ideas and then encourage questions after that. So these are the four pillars of an economy and a knowledge economy that help push it forward. And as you can see from this, India as a country is still far behind on some of these. So one other thing that a knowledge economy does is that they encourage arts, humanities and science. The best civilizations, Roman civilization, Greek civilization, Indus Valley civilization, Egyptian civilization, major, major strides <clears throat> in science and arts. Unless you have these, you cannot move forward. You cannot just go to the office, work, and expect for the economy to improve. You need to have things that will help you along the way. You need to have music. You need to have some form of art. You need to have sport. These are the major tenets. And again, the reason why I'm making this point is that India needs to do some of these to be able to move forward as a knowledge economy. And unless you do that, the scope of what we do will be limited. We will move forward, but we will not move forward as much as we want. What's VUCA? Okay, so yeah, I'm guessing you guys are hearing this daily, right? right? So VUCA is actually very old now. Everybody knows this. The big thing about this, and again, guys, I'm not trying to make any of you uncomfortable. I'm just having a conversation. Please treat this as a conversation. I'm not trying to put any of you in the spot. Uh, I've sat on the other side. I don't feel the need to come and preach. I feel the need for us to interact because then it becomes a more engaging conversation. I learn and so do you. So the most important thing about VUCA is that it's not just in business. It's in our lives as well. Everything about our lives is volatile. How many of you think that your future is uncertain. <laughs> okay. How many of you actually believe that your life is complex? <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, how many of you believe that everything around you is ambiguous? All of us, right? So it's extended beyond just work. Everything around it, everything around us is volatile. Everything around us is complex. So the first thing that we need to do is to understand that everything is complex and volatile and ambiguous. It's very easy to say this. The point that they keep saying is embrace the fact that things are not going to be easy. Your outlook towards things change. Embrace it. 
you could be on the way to the airport and something would happen that you would actually miss your flight. I almost missed my flight yesterday. So everything is complex. Everything is, what's even more important is everything is connected as well. So a chain of events can lead into multiple things. The reason why I'm saying this is that as you enter, how many of you have done internships till now? All of you? Okay. So I have, a, I have, I want to talk about that a bit. As you enter your corporate world or as you enter uh, employment, you will realize very quickly that a lot of what you learned in school, a lot, is absolutely irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. I did an MBA from the US from a pretty good school. Um, I was not a good student. I spent time, I got re reasonable grades. But I realized very early on that I needed to learn outside of that. My grades were only going to get me so far. I needed to network with people. I needed to talk to my professors. I needed to figure out industry connects. And that too came to me because some people told me that. Otherwise, I was that person sitting in the class, taking notes and trying to get through each session, that person or that person or that. That's what I was doing, right? The world in general is changing faster than we can imagine or predict. Do you guys believe that? Okay. This is the scary part. The change in the next five years will be equivalent to the last 25 years. And then the change in the next five years after that will be equivalent to the last 50 years. So the exponential nature of change is scary. We go through business cycles in a year that the generations before us were going through in 10 years. And in five years from now, they will go through changes that people went through for 20 years, in two years. It's absolutely scary. Absolutely scary. I'm trying to scare you on purpose because you are going to go into a world that is going to be all of this. But I'm also going to try and help you to get some level of confidence and give you perspectives that have helped me as well. What's the common theme around all of this? I see a lot of people starting to smile when they saw Tinder on the uh, right. What's the common theme on all of this? Trend, you said. Okay. You said disruption. Sorry? Innovation. You can speak. So the common theme, none of these existed five years ago. Okay. But how many of you know blockchain? Okay, I don't know much, so I'll have, we'll have to talk after. How many of you know and explain Bitcoin? Very good. How many of us use Uber? A lot of us. How many of you know UPI? What UPI is? I know, obviously, United Payment Interface. GST we know, Swiggy we know, and Tinder obviously we know, right? Point is, we are using things today so much that did not exist five years ago. And in the next two years, we will use things that did not exist two years ago. So the concept, and Sir talked about this, a product life cycle, a concept of what is part of our lives is changing so much that you will have to get used to the fact that you are going to be doing something that you did not even imagine. Be it work, be it life, 
be it anything. So, this is again, I am stressing this again because you will have to embrace this. This is how change is going to happen. You are going to use things that you never did. Your parents, your friends, your relatives will never understand some of this and it is okay for them not to understand. Right? Where is India in all of this complexity? Look at this chart of all the large economies we are going to have and we do have the youngest population 0 to 24. China has actually relaxed its one child policy. Do you know why? Just one, put your hand up and say that, yeah, population is growing old, declining sex ratio. They are realizing that in 30 years, half the population is going to be above the age of 60 and they do not want to be working. And look at how much we are adding. We have a propensity. This is one of the few things that India is very good at adding to the population, right? We are adding, we continue to add well and we are continuing to educate this group and we are continuing to create that ecosystem where it could be a demographic dividend or a demographic disaster. A demographic disaster is something that is happening in Spain. A demographic disaster is something that is happening in Greece. People are finishing education and not finding employment. People are finding employment but unable to maintain their lifestyle. The employment rate in the 30 age group in these countries is north of 40 percent. What happens when 40 percent of your group is unemployed? What are you guys going to be doing? You are going to start asking for things. Why am I not employed? Why are there no jobs? Those are the people who take to the streets. Those are the people who create revolutions. Those are the people who disrupt. I am talking in a good way as well. So, we have a massive challenge. We have 18 lakh engineers or what, a month or something like that? 1.8 million, 2 million a year that we are putting out. Look at the amount of employment we need to generate. Just look at all of us. But what is the amazing thing about India that I have noticed and I will tell you? It always looks bleak, but we always move forward. India has never had one year of negative growth ever. We have grown 0.1 percent, but we have grown. We have never degrown. So, as a country, we will always find a way to do it. But I want to tell you the magnitude of the problem with this kind of age group joining the workforce every year. We are going to be the maximum English speaking country in the world. But we have one advantage that other English speaking countries do not. What is that? We have about 20 versions of English. English, 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 all of that, right? So, what does that do for us? It allows us to survive in different ecosystems, meaning that Indians are more adaptable to change than most other countries. Why do Indians do so well abroad? Because they go adapt. We can speak American English, we can speak English, we can speak English in Europe, we can do all of that. So, but we will become the largest English speaking country in the world. And what, why is that so important? Business communication in general 
around the world, 90% of it is in English. So when you automatically have the largest English speaking country in the world, wherever you are, the chances of you being on top of the workforce is automatic. It's just a matter of numbers. It's not a lot of thinking to do. When you require English speaking people, there's a lot of us, right? And we are highly educated. The other one, software developers. It's not a big statistic that I think we should be proud of. I would say something that the largest group of innovators, largest group of entrepreneurs, I would add that as well. But yeah, we know how to code. We know how to do IT. India's IT. We are on top of the chain and we will continue to be on top of the chain. And we will become one of the top two economies in the world. Even if we want to stop it, we can't. Even if our governments want to stop it, we can't. There are 650 million people who have not entered the smartphone era. Just imagine their purchasing power when they come in to the smartphone era. India's banking system has not reached 500 million people. Just imagine what happens when they get loans, when they start buying products, when they get financially included, inclusion as they call it. India, whether we like it or not, is going to become the second, if not the largest economy in the world. There's no stopping. It's going to happen. So here are my perspectives after I've sufficiently confused you. There are universities giving a course content for free. How many of you know this? Okay, interesting. Including a small university called Stanford. You can actually take a course for free in Stanford. So why do we want to come to biology or why do you want to go somewhere else? So this is the challenge that a university faces today. What they do is that they capture the student population. By offering a MOOC, you have access to 100 million students that you did not have before. Once you capture a student and you capture his or her attention, your ability to generate the next level of course content, your ability to generate the next level of revenue generating course content is much higher. So a top university is actually offering this in the hopes that you will come back and subscribe for their paid content or you will apply to come there. They actually write agreements. How many of you know of this company called Y Combinator? Y Combinator. Y Combinator takes in people in batches to do a startup. And if they like you, they give you money. This is all for free in exchange for a stake in your organization. And it is purely done to generate the next level of ideas. Airbnb came out of that. Many companies come out of that. Why are people doing this for free? You're challenging the entire educational and innovation ecosystem. Why are they doing it for free? It's because from an educational institution perspective, the two years or three years of course fees that you pay is done within three years. When you have the opportunity to connect with the student much longer, the payback, and I'm not talking money, payback in terms of value, the payback in terms of university enrichment, and the payback in terms of later enrollment is much, much higher. So the concept of learning itself is undergoing this change. So when you say what are the business disruptions that are happening and how should B-schools be doing this? There are B-schools 
offering stuff online for free. So, how much more difficult can it get for another B school? We know this. There is an entire generation that is growing up with a different outlook on learning. How many of you know Khan Academy? Okay. Salman Khan, of course. Free math, the most difficult subject in the US. Free math. You can actually go there and learn. And it's been proven that if you go and download or view their YouTube videos and you go and learn, you do a better job. So, the traditional concept of a school and teaching math is going for a toss. Free. It's free. So, what's happening is, if you look at it from a university perspective, the concept of learning itself is changing. I took the traditional route that all of you took. I did my bachelor's. I went to the US to do my masters, I got a job. There is a large group of people who are not doing that. They are saying I want to learn on my own, I want to do a MOOC, I want to do, I want to do a startup. So as a university or as an educational institution, you need to create that platform that addresses this group because today you are a large percentage of the population that goes to a school. As the years go, that population will shrink. It's not that they'll stop learning. The traditional means of going to a school and doing that is different. There are certain things about going to a school that cannot be inculcated elsewhere. Discipline, timeliness. But guess what? The thought around that is also very different. There's a generation growing up thinking that it's fine to do the way I am as long as I am moving forward. So, it is a very, very fundamental challenge that universities or people itself are going to face. These people are willing to experiment with life experiences that no generation has before. How many of you know or actually let me ask you this other question. How many of you actually would be okay joining a startup? with of five people, four or five people, no funding, nothing. How many of you would actually say this is what I want to do? Okay. How many of you know of people who join, who work in a startup? How many of these people existed three years ago? Yeah, zilch, very few. People who are doing startups, and people who are generating employment today are not going to school. They are saying, I will find out, I will figure it out. They are very smart. Hence the startup boom. Hence the move away from traditional learning. Hence the move away from university education. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that what you are doing or what I have done is wrong. I am just saying, that the concept of education itself is changing in a big way. Be open to that. There is a very good chance that you will be in an organization and the person sitting next to you is less qualified and makes more money than you. It is the greatest frustration you can have. R.A.R. I did MBA, he is getting more. Get used to it. That is how it is going to be. The best schools offer amazing internships. As simple as that. As simple as that. And I am not talking about an internship with a multi billion dollar organization where you are doing photocopying six hours a day. That is not an internship or sitting in their cafeteria trying out all their exotic food and drink items. I am talking about a real internship. It does not have to be a big company. It has to be a good internship. 
There's a big difference. One of the things I realized early on, and this was when I was at Texas Instruments, I got a 17 year old intern. She had passed the CA along with the bachelor's, and she had she was so smart that she completed her bachelor's by 17 or 18, and she studied the CA on the side and passed that too, first attempt. Okay? I knew what I wanted to do at 18. None of that. I was partying at 18. So this person is focused. She wanted to start a uh, charitable organization. She wanted to provide for animals. She was very clear. And I realized very quickly that that generation is 20 times smarter than I or my generation can ever be. So till that point of time, in TI, we had two interns over five years. After that, we had 27 interns in two years. So I am a big, big, big believer in internships. And I am a big believer, and this is more from the corporate side and from the education side, that the onus is not on the intern. The onus is on the organization, both the school and the corporate. If as a 20-year-old or a 24-year-old, you go into an organization and you are on social media six hours a day because you have no work, they've met the internship quota, but they've not really given you any work. Who suffers? Chances are you will get the job that you want eventually. Who suffers eventually? The organization suffers. So the biggest challenge for a great school is to get an internship that is valuable to the student. The biggest challenge for an organization is to create an internship that is exciting to that student. Where they come back and say, listen, after I graduate, this is the company that I want to work for. Here's the manager that I want to work for. Here's what I want to do. I'm excited by what they're doing. Believe it or not, these companies exist. And they do very well. They have the largest pipeline of employees. They have the largest pipeline of talent. The best schools offer amazing internships, as simple as that. A lot of universities are now bringing industry people to come and teach. It's not because we know things that are, we know things better. We just tell you how it works in the real world. It's very different from the book. It's extremely different from the book. What's the most difficult thing you're studying right now? I'll take two questions. I'll take two answers, sorry. Somebody here? Oh, yes. Accounts, okay. Discipline, very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to take two answers. One is uh, I'm going to combine math or because I'm an accountant by training. I'll say, who said accounts? So they're hiding now. They don't want to say it anymore. Who said accounts? Somebody said accounts. Just raise your hand, it's okay. Okay, why would you say discipline is the most difficult thing? So after graduation, we are coming as a fresher in this college and we are having so many problems. So uh, get up on time and to match up with the college rules. So discipline is... Okay, please give a round of applause, that's very honest. And somebody said math or accounting. Okay. So I'll I'll go back and give my perspective on both. I was an accountant by training. I did my BCom and my most hated subject was tax. Somebody's already hitting his head. Man, tax. Right? My most hated subject was tax. 
Guess what? The first three things that I did at work were all tax related. I did better at work in tax than I ever did in school. You, whether you like it or not, you're going to get hit. It's this fundamental concept. You attract. Have you? How many of you have heard this statement? You attract what you fear. So if you think tax is bad, that's all you're going to get, really. And this concept of discipline, it's very, very interesting because I and I will I have met a couple of my school friends yesterday. Firstly, they can't believe that I'm telling talking to students because I was the one who had discipline issues all the time. Like I said, I, those are the two seats that I used to take. You will end up in organizations which have strict discipline criteria. I've worked for an organization where they said you have to have lunch between 12 and 1.30. You have to have lunch between 12 and 1.30. So I said the first thing I will do is to leave this organization if you don't change this. And I had the HR reported to me, so I changed it. If I'm going to be telling my employees when they should eat as an employee, then already I'm having other issues. But on the flip side, you will start to have discipline related matters around documentation. You will have discipline related matters around conference calls. The standard etiquette around conference calls is if you are not joining in within five minutes, the other person can drop off the call. And you don't want to be doing this when your manager is in the US or when your boss is in another country or in a different location. So what you're learning right now, the most difficult thing that you have a problem with, in all likelihood, is the first thing that you will be facing. Because you have a problem with it. You will never learn it as well as you experience it. I never learned tax till I actually did a transaction. Deferred tax asset. I don't even I don't even like it, but I had to do it. I had discipline issues. Today I think I'm a little bit more disciplined than I was. These are the things that are going to hit you when you hit the corporate world. You can learn a lot of things. What is going to hit you is in a different perspective. Talent is always portable. No matter what a visa ban does, no matter how protectionist a country is, no matter what happens in the world, talent is always portable. It's a matter of time. India had this concept of brain drain. You know this, right? Why did that happen? The emergency forced some people to say, okay, I want to go find employment elsewhere. The reservation system forced people to leave. Now what do we have? Brain? They are talking brain gain. Everyone wants to come back to India. Talent is always portable. How many foreign students study in India now? Let me just tell you, a lot. How many of you have considered going abroad to study other than the US? Okay. Which countries have you considered? Okay, Canada. Germany, Ireland, Australia. Okay. I want uh, I want two answers. One for the person who said uh, Ireland and one for the person who said Germany. What do you want to study? What have you thought? Uh, sir, I did my graduation in aerospace engineering. And post that, I wanted to uh, go to Germany for a master's. Uh, master's so in aerospace. Why Germany? Right? In aerospace. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, why Germany? Because uh, German, German, uh, it's always been the most advanced country, be it uh, during industrialization, post-industrialization, and even in uh, uh, today's world. Uh, Germany is, I mean, it's considered quite advanced in every sphere. Agreed. Awesome. 
please give him a round of applause. I'm curious about Ireland. Who said Ireland? I think that person's changed his or her mind. They're not going to Ireland. You said Ireland. Or they're trying to get people to. See, I would do, I would do exactly what you did. I would point to somebody else and say that's the person who did that. It's very cheeky, very nice. But the point I'm making here is that 10 years ago, everybody wanted to go to the US to study. 15 years ago, US is the place we want to go. It's not like that anymore. The world's changing. There are other amazing opportunities in other countries. That's why I'm saying talent is always portable. We get job, re job requests from people who live all over the world. I get people sending me emails saying, can I please write your HR? I live in Netherlands. I live in the US. I live in Singapore. Can I come and work for your company? Talent is always portable. Okay. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my value system to confuse you a little bit more and to help you think. What you will be remembered by is your value system. It what defines you as a person. Always. Always. He's a good person. He, she's a good person. He's very successful. But the fundamental basis of this is your value system. It's what defines you. Invest where you want to grow. Always. The average, so the last two months or three months, I've been reading about what successful CEOs do. Guess what? I do 10% of it. I'm not ashamed to admit it. The average CEO, average good performing CEO reads 50 books a year. That's one book a week. The average CEO does not have a WhatsApp notification. There's no notifications on their phones. There's no distractions. They check their phones once in two hours. How often do we check our phones? Yeah, it's almost like the phone controls our life. Learning is constant. Always be curious. Everyone can become a CEO. Everyone can become what they want to be. Never stop learning. Teach others. I learned this late, but I'm telling you when I can. Teach others. You end up learning more teaching. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Even what you know, you teach somebody and you will learn a lot more. How many of you have read a book called The Black Swan? Yes or no? Or? Okay. Okay. There's one there. What was the concept of the black swan? Whoever read it. Do you want to talk, man? The guy who raised his hand over there. No, you don't want to talk. Okay, fine. So the concept of a black swan, and if you haven't read the book, I recommend that you do, is that nobody knew that a black swan existed in the world till they actually saw a black swan. So the concept that is there is that know what you don't know. I do not know artificial intelligence. I can say honestly, I don't know it. Be honest about what you don't know because it will encourage learning. Do you know what you don't know? It's a very, very fundamental, confusing question. But always think about it. Do the best you can. Abdul Kalam sir said something. 
bloom where you are sown simple and guess where he ended up he became the president of the country bloom where you are sown always do the best you can never accept mediocrity even if you are chatting even if you are doing something on social media don't do anything mediocre always do the best either from yourselves or from others expect excellence and you will see these people they stand out always start thinking like that today you will be different people in a year forget 20 years this is one of my favorite success is what you define not uncle dad mom wife girlfriend boyfriend none of that it's what you define success is what you define it to be always a lot of people their definition of success is to be happy not money not cars if you talk to some of these entrepreneurs you guys know this company called practo it was formed because the guy couldn't find a doctor for his aunt when she was ill it's probably 26 years old 27 years old worth 100 million dollars they are the same they are happy that they've connected people to doctors it's a very different metric of success so success is what you define it to be always another favorite thing in in the indian context it's okay to think bad things what if this happens what if that will what if you don't get this job what if you don't get married what is there's a scientific term for it it's called risk management only when you think bad things you prepare for them here are the things that i don't want to happen in my life so i am going to make sure that i set myself up for that it's okay to think bad things you don't have to be this beacon of positive energy all the time it's okay to think bad things what i talked about earlier embrace things that don't fit your thought process things you don't know always say okay i don't know this this is how i think a job should be it's not like that so let me think embrace things that don't fit in your thought process always i think this is the last one enjoy life it's one life do things that make you happy steve jobs said a lot of his best quotes when he was about to die he realized that a lot of what he was doing was actually good and it made him happy always do things that make you happy believe me you will be successful you will earn a lot of money you will do everything that you want i think that's it uh so uh it's a conditional questions like condition based question uh the first situation is when uh, a person of fresher like us uh wants to enter in the industry and then they are told that you don't have a specific degree or a specialization something like that so we can't hire you because of that they uh you know join some institutes to get specialized in some uh, uh technology or in some uh field and when again they enter into the organization they got to know that they are not fit for the job because they are not you know that much updated and uh, whatever they have learned in the curriculum uh, it is not related with what the industry is expecting so how the student like us can manage the both situations okay right. so very i went through that so when i graduated from my mba i searched for a job for 6 months and it was not a very can you hear me search for a job for 6 months it was not a very great time for the us economy and uh, 
I was considering returning back to India without a job. The number of people who told me, and I'm not even joking, learn Java, learn .NET at that time, C++, SAP, FICO. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I bring a certain skill set to a job. I have an MBA in finance. I'm going to make sure that I present myself as that person. I'm not going to go to a C++, not that I have anything against it. I'm not going to do something just to get a job. Please understand that. The day you do that, you will always be doing something. I'm not saying it's wrong. But is that what you want? So it took me longer than most people. It took me six months. And when you have no job and no money, and you are hesitant to ask your parents for money, it's a bad situation. Okay? But guess what? The concept of life. Everything that goes down comes up. And everything that goes up comes down. You will find a job. The key is to believe in it. The key is to believe that you will find a job in the area that you want. What it made me do is that I started talking to people saying, what do I need to change in my resume? Who do I need to talk to? What kind of... So I went and talked, met my professors again. What kind of jobs are being offered? Do I have that skill set? So don't do something because that is the trend. If you've studied something because you believe in a certain characteristic about yourself, believe in that and pursue that. If you fail, you're failing doing something you want. You will still have a better feeling of it two years later. Nothing lasts. A bad job search experience will not last. Believe me, I've been through this. I graduated without a job and I didn't have money. I was borrowing money from my friends because I did not want to borrow money from my parents. It will come back. But you have to believe that. And you have to set yourself up for that. That's important. Good morning, sir. Sir, on your Good morning. Left. Uh, so you had mentioned in your earlier slides that creativity and ideas is over land, labor and capital. So uh, when we sit for our placements or anything ahead in our life, how would we create value or show to the other person that we are more creative and, idea and have ideas? How would we present ourselves? How would you present yourself to me right now if I say, what do you bring to mob me? I would say that I have uh, some values that I stick to and I would, uh, whenever would I, I would uh, join your organization, I would, va I would create uh, and add value to your organization. How? Uh, by uh, sticking to my values. Okay. It's a very nice answer. But how are you going to create value for me in analytics? Uh, sorry, I did not get you. I have an analytics business. How are you going to create value for me in analytics? Uh, by uh, learning more about analytics because I have less knowledge about it right now. But uh, yeah, learning about it and whatever I learn, I would deliver it to your organization. So it's an important point that you make. A lot of jobs require a specific skill set. Like we require something called a data scientist, right? If you've not studied to be a data scientist, obviously you or I cannot do that job. But a lot of people are selected because of the attitude that they bring to the role. A lot of people remain and grow in the roles because of the attitude that they bring to the job, the discipline, the attitude that they take forward. A good organization will always recognize it during the interview process. If they've not recognized it, either it's not coming out as well as you want it to come out, or they are not good enough for you. Right? So the most important thing for you to go and say is, and it's a, it's a version of what I said, always be the best version of what you can be. And that question can be answered only by one person, and that's yourself. Am I the best version today of what I am capable of doing? That will bring out, and this is very subjective, this is very intangible. That will bring out a certain kick to your step, how you act and how you talk. It's very recognizable. 
it's very quickly recognizable. I meet people in the airport or in a restaurant or something. I take their numbers and give it to my HR. And I said, dude, call this guy, just have a conversation. If he or she is looking for a job at any time, we need to contact him. Or the next job that opens up, make sure that we call this person. So I have a list of people I want to hire. We don't have jobs for them. That's because of the attitude and the spunk that they have. Always look at it this way. If you go internal, you'll say, am I the best version of myself? And you will see that you can improve. It will come out. You can actually apply to roles and you will get pushed towards roles that you didn't think you could have got. Honest to God, I did not apply for this job. I did not apply for the CEO role. I did not go and tell the board, guys, I want to be the CEO of Movement. The board called and said, listen, we have, we want to change the direction of this company. We want to do certain things. Can you be the CEO? These things come out. It's for the CEO job, it's the same for your first job as well. It doesn't change. Thank you, sir. Silent gratitude isn't it much used to anyone. Good morning, everyone. I, Anmol Arya Grawal, student manager, feel honored and privileged today to get an opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to our respected guest speaker, Mr. Satya Kalyan Sundaram, sir. On behalf of Shri Balaji Society, I express my profound gratitude to our guest for inspiring his valuable time to guide us for a successful career and bright future. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experience with us. A big thanks to Sir for his effort towards effective innovation, knowledge of economy. Asking a question is a very, very much important. You will always be remembered by your value system. You attract what you fear and never stop le uh, learning, teach others. Finally, I would like to thank our beloved Bala Sir for his guidance and providing us such a stimulating and learning environment with us. Thank you.